You're listening to Rio Radio, the nationally trusted name in real estate investing. We dig deep to discover investors' why in real estate. If you want to skip all the BS and get in investors' heads, you're in the right spot. Be one of the thousands to check out RioRadio.com. This was hilarious. What could really help you in your business? And I said, well, somebody that speaks Swahili would really help me in my business. And then, you know, you need to kind of hang on to some skills just in case you need them at a later date if nobody's available. It, well, it, it comes with just being busy, I think. I think yeah. we all kind of just, you know, get in our grind and, the, and then we forget about what really makes us money in the end. Yeah. And if you're a new investor, I, I get that this is probably like, oh, God, please, I don't want to go through this because it's a process, not an event to build in a relationship. It's like build the well before you get thirsty, you know, the Jordan Harbinger. Uh, you love that line. I do. Um, <laughs> well, it's not my place anymore because I just sold it on Friday. Dude, I so, didn't know that. I, awesome. Uh, Today's episode is brought to you by JM Real Estate Capital. Hi, it's Rob, JM Real Estate Capital. We're the money guys that you need to know for all your real estate investments. Talk to us. We can do what your local bank can't or won't do. We don't have millions, we have trillions with a T to lend. 844-WE-CLOSE or go online at jmrecapital.com. That's jmrecapital.com. JM Real Estate Capital, smart solutions for the real estate investor. Welcome to Rio Radio, episode 121 with Owen Dashner and Ted Kosh. <laughs> kind of a different little twist on things. Well, you know, all the years we talked about just doing you and I on here. But this is it's never happened. So this is a full length OT with Owen and Ted, but I still think I, I was workshopping this idea and I th I still think we should have a segment called Ted Talks. Ted Talks. Let us know let us know what you uh, you think out there listener listeners, I, but I, I think that's been branded. Uh, yeah, but it's the unofficial TED Talk. Unofficial. How about that? Okay, there, there we, we go. go. TED Real Estate Talk. Yeah. I don't know. We're we're still coming up with some ideas. The TRT. On that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure -E -talk. that <laughs> that is a completely it, it, different. It, it's a it's a it's a it's a treat or a treat. <laughs> Maybe we come with an A in there and it could be a treat. Well, as a 49 year old male, I have a different connotation for what TRT means than you do. Clearly, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so what's up, man? How's life with uh, in the Kosh household? You know, I've been uh, I got a new uh, Airbnb that's finally done. Okay, how much sleep have you been getting this last week? I think that since okay, so recording it, we're recording this on Friday, and I think since Saturday, I have probably gotten twenty hours of sleep. I had two nights that I got one and a half hours of sleep. Okay, so you did this yourself? Why? So I just need, it was a time frame thing, and uh, there wasn't. We just had tornadoes hit in the area, so there's limited help available, and I wanted to get this property up and ready so we could potentially have some families that could utilize the property because what, there's a shortage. What of is homes. the? What do you think is the biggest pain in the ass with uh, with getting an Airbnb brought online? Something that you bought, you're renovated uh, throughout the whole process, and the goal is to have a kick ass Airbnb. What's the biggest pain? Uh, well, furnishing is the biggest pain. Uh, I mean, I. It's the little details because like, and then you're like going back through it and you're like, oh man, this trim doesn't look right. And then uh, you, you set up a TV and the wiring is going, and then I buy it by a game system and the wires don't stretch to the plug in areas, you know, and it's just, it's just the little details. And then you know that you're like, you know what, I just got to get this up and I'm going to fix those little details as we go. And then like landscaping, I got a lot of stuff that I still want to do with landscaping. It's good enough, but it's not where I wanted it to be. Yeah, and I have I have the the one that's a penthouse unit in a four story apartment building, so it's the whole top floor. I've talked about it before on the podcast, but I always and I still self manage this probably stupidly, and well, it is for a fact. Stupidly, but, uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, not to compete with Boosty. <laughs> yeah, but, there we go. But uh, I, I still go over there before every booking just to make sure everything's buttoned up. That's and smart. The windows aren't open or there's not cigarette butts in the ashtray on the deck or whatever because that stuff has happened. And I know if I miss that, it's a detail that can come back and bite you with a review. Well, mine is going to go active today. Okay. And I, I showed you a few pictures of it. Uh, that, you know, there's a couple things I'd still like to finish. But, like, I ran in today and I had a couple pictures I don't hang today. I had uh, one. I had one of those great uh, smoke detectors that last ten years, but oh, it, yeah. it didn't even make it six months, and <laughs> so I had to replace one of those. So I just kind of get those finishing details off, and I'm. Uh, I went to go put everything on the Airbnb site. The fun part about that was, 
I have a, a property manager that manages a handful of Airbnbs for me, and we have it under a phone number. And I, I went to start the new one, and like, oh, that phone number is already in use. You gotta disconnect that phone number from your other your other uh, properties to get this one going. So like, it, it's been a nightmare kind of switching that around. Wait, wait, you you mean you you, you want to have a different phone number for every Airbnb that you have? No. Um, so I have a property manager that helps me with uh, five units. Yep. And uh, my name is on that one. But so it's it, hosted by Ted. It is, and I ha- I'm creating a separate host profile because I'm gonna I'm trying managing my first one by myself. Okay. So I, I'm like, okay, so oh, I got gotcha. you. So you got to go into Airbnb.com, create, create yeah. a brand new profile because you're not co-hosting with somebody now. You're you're just doing it solo. I'm gonna try it, yeah. And uh, and I bought in some platforms because I so I have Boostly making me a website that should be done any time. And uh, I, I got the owner res uh, property, uh, property management uh, system to help me with. It's like kind of like your brainchild to everything. Okay. And then uh, uh, I'm using turno.com. Uh, so you put in your cleaners and then it automatically will notify the cleaners when the property is ready for cleaning and gives them the time frame. And it automatically pays them through your credit card as soon as the work's done. They upload the pictures and everything right into the system. Okay. And you give them your, like, you give them, it, it provides the checklist of the stuff that they have to check off that they did too, which mm-hmm. is kind of cool. And it does a lot more. I'm still learning a lot. Uh, and then I got AirDNA I'm connecting into it. Uh, there's a lock service called Schlage. So every time a new person books, it automatically gives them a, a, a four digit code that's the last four digits of their phone number. And it starts the minute that they're uh, allowed in and it ends the minute they're out. So it's all automated. Yeah, that's pretty slick. So I'm learning. So this a lot. seems like a lot of moving parts and a lot of different bolt-ons that you gotta it, have for your. It's so like I'm like right now I'm just like there's so much like Onres is like really like huge and there's so much to it. There's like a lady who's like, oh, you pay me fifteen hundred dollars and I'll set it all up for you because that's how complicated it is because mm-hmm. it does so much. It's the, literally the best and oldest system out there though. And so I'm like, I'm gonna figure this out. But then I'm here, I am figuring this out, and then I'm like, okay, so I'm gonna. I'm going to hook up the Turno and all these, you know, sub things, right? Well, each sub thing is a whole other site you got to learn. And hmm. it, once you get it set up, it connects in and you should be hands off, but you still got to set it up. Uh, I, I took a lot of advice from the Ryan Miller podcast that we did uh, back in the... Oh, yeah. You know, like yeah. Tech he tech had a laundry 20. list of tips. Yeah. And he, he, he had his 100% automated. So I'm, I'm trying to go that route. And seeing if I can make it work. So I'm I'm using a lot of I'm I re-listen that podcast just to make sure I could do this right. <laughs> now this new one you're bringing online. This is uh this has got a special place in your heart. Obviously you've talked about it. It's an old uh, a family home. Your your grandmother lived there when my family came to the country from Brazil. This mm-hmm. is the first house they ever lived in, and I bought it back in 2008. Okay, let's let's talk about pricing. How do you go about if you got an Airbnb and it's a brand new one, you want to bring it online? How do you have any idea what you should set your pricing at? Okay. Okay, so if you don't have Air DNA, which is the easiest way to price it out because it will auto do it. And is that but, free or is it a cost? There's a cost to it. And I, I don't know the cost right off the top okay. of my head. But uh, Airbnb does show you the comps when you're setting up the property for the first time. It says, here's the, here's the comps that are right around you. So then you can click on them and, the, and it gives you a suggested price immediately. And so my particular property, it said your suggested price was like 237 Okay. And then it showed me comps that were all within a few blocks of it. And uh, the highest, I mean, it was comps three, four hundred dollars a night that were up there, and I felt like my property was actually comparable, if not nicer. So I was like, okay, I, I want to get some good ratings, but I want to get a book today. So, what? Hey, let so me I ask you lower. something. So this is kind of I'm, what my mind went to was, you know, if you go get three different bids from three different contractors, you might have, like, if you called somebody that's advertising on TV and like they're, you know, like let's. For anybody that's listening to this that's in Omaha, there's several companies like, let's say, Thrasher uh, mm-hmm. Basement Systems, where you, you you know, obviously worked before. They're kind of like the Cadillac. Uh, like, they they spend the most on advertising. Therefore, typically, those costs are going to be passed on in their pricing, mm-hmm. right? So, they're kind of like, if you're just looking through and finding the most marketed companies, you're probably going to pay the most. What What is your... And, and then those type of contractors typically are priced higher... But they're okay not getting all the bids. So they may get, say, 10% of them that they bid on or 20. I don't know what the numbers are. But then you have other contractors maybe at the lower end of the pricing range where they get 80% of the bids. 
but their pricing is low and that's why, but you may not get as quality of a work. Like, I guess where I'm going with this is how do you arrive at what the sweet spot is? Do you want to, would you rather have a higher price and not booked as often, or would you rather have a lower price and then constant bookings? Well, I guess it depends on your property and how you want it taken care of too. Because the lower price that you go, the lower uh, quality guests that you're going to get or potential party uh, place it's going to become, right? Mm -hmm. So my mentality going into this was I just, as long as I break even on it and, and I'm keep maintaining the property and keeping it in the family, that's great. Um, right now, I'm going a little bit lower because I need to get some good reviews. Sure. And, yep. and I don't have any bookings on the calendar, so I'm going lower right now. But as soon as um, I get a few bookings in there and I iron out the things that I'm missing, get some knowledge back, from that point, I'll actually raise it up. And I'll probably be one of the, the probably in the top ten percent highest because I I want quality bookings that um, fill the place that aren't partying uh, families. Uh, it's really a family geared property. I have, mm -hmm. a, I have a kids area with toys and bunk beds and so on. How how uh, many nights for a minimum do you have? I haven't I haven't set that up. So uh, like what actually, do you, what I, do you I, think I, you're gonna th do? It'll be a thirty night minimum, or the minimum will probably be two nights. And the maximum will be 30 nights. Okay, so two-night minimum. Yeah. So you want them just staying on the weekend uh, if they're going to pick a weekend night. Yeah, because my, my cleaner is going to be, you know, the I think 110 to clean the place every time. Oh, wow. Okay. Because and they do laundry and all that? Yep. Dang, that's a pretty good price, so. actually. I need to talk to you after. Pass that on. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's good stuff. And I, I just, uh, it's interesting because, you know, with interest rates uh, affecting what people can buy now, and a lot of people have pumped the brakes on acquiring rental properties or doing the Burr method. Um, if you incorporate, say, short term rentals into the mix in order to help juice your cash flow a little bit, you kind of need to know what you're doing before you just pull the trigger and, and jump in. Uh, without really a game plan, or, so knowing the the pitfalls and the and the costs and everything that it takes to get it set up is is pretty important, I think. Well, after going my, through my first eviction last week, I, I, I it tells me I want to do Airbnbs from this point. Oh, that how did that go? By the way, let's talk about that. So you haven't ever done one, correct? Well, yeah, I just don't. I mean, this is the only the. I mean, now it's my third long-term I've ever done. Okay, so it was a long-term rental. And uh, so there was a local group called Lutheran Family Services that placed uh, my tenants in this four-bedroom home. Okay. Getting great money on rent, uh, 21, 2200 right around there. Now, did you get paid directly from LFS or yeah. was it from the tenant? So LFS, LFS paid for the, for the first three months. That's kind of their standard. They paid for the first three months. Um, by then, their goal is to have the people into housing or into, into a job and have the kids in school. And if they need to continue to assistance, they'll help them, but they need to start paying their own bills by the, by, by month four. Now, are they, now I, and I know you're going to talk more about this, but is Lutheran Family Services, in, for example, I'm not sure if they're nationwide. I, I think I, they are. Pretty positive they are. Uh, which, ironically, that Airbnb that I just talked about that I own, yeah. that, that whole building was owned by Lutheran Family Services mm -hmm. before I bought it. Yep. So, um, but do they place now you were talking about basically getting a family up on their feet and all that are they typically just working with people that are not from the u.s originally again i, I don't know that answer 100 okay to, but to this speak on it. this was correct yeah they are from uh tanzania and okay. they speak swahili well the person that placed them um spoke swahili but then that guy quit and then there was no <laughs> communication there after and because of the lack of communication, there's no if there's no communication, the services discontinue immediately. With the LFS, and, you mean? Yes. Okay. So I went through and uh, and went to LFS afterwards because now I was unaware of this. I, I had the property listed for sale and had, had a buyer, and it was contingent on the rent being uh, up to date. And so when I found out that they haven't been paid since January – Oops. Yeah, I was like, oh, man, I need to step in here and, and try to help. So I went to the organization, met with somebody uh, in person. They were actually really easy to work with. They wanted to help. And I was like, hey, I got, uh, I think, five adults uh, or, yeah, five adults and, like, five kids in the, in the property roughly. And uh, Wow. And I'm like, I'm like, you're not going to – it might be eight kids, but it was, it, it's a big house. And I'm like, there's no way that you – these guys are going to be able to find another house like this because a lot of people are, are reluctant to even help out people there from another country, especially you know third world countries because they don't take care of the property as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, these guys are going to be in their butt. They have nowhere to go. And if they have an eviction on their record, what's going to happen? Yep. You cannot mess this up. you got to get it settled up. 
So they're like, hey, there's lack of communication. I actually went to a real estate meetup. Yeah, I was, I was, I was going to bring this up, but <laughs> they, 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 they said this hey, was you know, hilarious. What could really help you in your business? And I said, well, somebody that speaks Swahili would really help me in my business. And then what happened? And Mary steps up. She's like, I, I speak Swahili. <laughs> and I'm like, and I like, <laughs> there's like 40 people here, and one of the 40 happened to speak Swahili, and everybody just yeah. kind of like it went quiet, and everybody looked at her. It was, just, it was just hilarious. I think everybody started laughing. Crapping, and that's but. the point. <laughs> uh, like we've harped on this so many times over the years, but like you you got to get out and meet people because just like Ted said, what would help you in your business right now? And he just like pulls that out of his butt uh, and not, he, you weren't even serious. That was being a smart ass. Yeah. You were, he was <laughs> totally being sarcastic and he's like, Oh, so when he speaks Swahili and then somebody in the crowd's like, I speak Swahili. <laughs> and we're like, what? So it was, it was really funny, but you never know until you ask the question. Right. Yeah. And so, um, she got on the phone. I showed up at the property. I put her on the phone. I talked to the adult kids that were there and they're like, yep, mom and dad are at work. Um, we understand the situation we're in. Uh, and I'm like, here's the phone number for the service. If you don't want to lose your house, no matter what, we have a fiction court. It's our, it, it's our, the dates already set. It's in three days. Mm-hmm. You know, But at this point, if you want a chance to stay here, you need to get a hold of this guy and he'll help you. So we get to court. They had representation uh, through the organization. They had somebody there to talk. They knew that they're in a position that that they need that they need to keep that family there, so they were willing to work with us. And they're like, yep, we'll have you a letter of intent to pay by this date, and we'll be paid in full by the end of May, which was like eight grand. And whoa, and so they're like, yep. Uh, so the the they paid a couple thousand dollars last week last week, the 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 tenants, and then the organization matched that uh, today. And so they're paying off that old debt, and uh, it looked like they were going to have a place to stay. I put, I told, but not your place. Well, it's not my place anymore because I just sold it on Friday, dude. So I didn't know that. I, awesome. Uh, I so I I called the I was working with the buyer, and I was very transparent. All this is probably listening to us now. So hi, Bryce. And uh, I, I, you know, I was very clear with him. I'm like, hey, man. I go, I go. Everything should be good now, but. Is his first buy, and I didn't want to put him in a bad position. Sure. So I wanted to make sure that this was all figured out. So I put a, I did an escrow holdback. Yeah, welcome to real estate <laughs> yeah. investing. Hey, here's your first eviction with people that don't speak English at all. Well, I did an escrow holdback, and I and I put a five thousand dollar guarantee on him. Like, hey, if, if they had to be evicted on the thirty first, this five thousand dollars will go to you to help you with um, any renovation and and covering rent while the property's uh, smart down. Yeah. And and I, I was already going to do. I think I appraised for like two thirty. I, I sold to him for two hundred. I was you know because there's no commissions or anything figured in a deal. And I'm helping a client out too. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's like, you know, that makes that makes this a lot easier to stomach. Plus, there's a huge earnest deposit down too because uh, usually with these organizations, you get bigger earnest deposit uh, to cover damages. Are you talking about security deposit? Yeah, sorry, security deposit. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that that all helped the situation, and that and so they made more sense for him. It looks like they're going to be able to continue living there, and they're getting assistance as as they need. And it seems like a win win situation. I'm going to get my earnest or my uh, security deposit back. Uh, and then, uh, not my security deposit. I'm going to get my, um, I'm going to get my past due rent, past due rent. And then I'm going to get my $5,000, uh, hold that I put on. Well, good for you, dude. So, that sounds like a kind of a win, win, win. It, yeah. And you know, I think I'll be, everybody will be happy. And he's got a good property. I mean, that one's in a great up and coming area. I don't know. Did, I don't know if I brought this up, but, uh, on the podcast before, but I, I also had an eviction recently that, and I haven't been to one. It's probably been, I posted I, a picture for mine. Did you ten, see it? Yeah, I did. That was the pretty bailiff funny. Gave, uh, you, my, you, gotta, you should post the, that in the show notes. The bailiff gave my property manager like evil eyes. Oh, really? And he took it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sorry. man. So uh, I had one about probably a, it was right around a month ago. Have I talked about this? I, I can't remember if so. I brought it up. So I had this, uh, God, I, this is, I'm so dumb for doing this. This but is like another friend one. It was not a friend, but somebody that I knew from my hometown. Okay. And they, uh, I ag- against my own judgment, I gave them a deal on the on the property. They've been there the last six years, and then just started get not started. They were like I come I come to find out they held it together when I finally m- met them again after years of not seeing them since my childhood basically, and they were seemingly somewhat normal. And then was they were looking for a rental property and then moved in and then just turn into a freaking whack job 
like just nonsensical stuff, like completely off off the rails with uh, communication. I'm like, what is going on? Like only would pay in cash, which, you know, on the one hand, cash doesn't bounce, which I like. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, like she insisted on giving it to me in person, which I don't like at all. What should you do for a living? I don't know. Okay, Who knows? <laughs> I like started with cleaning houses. Then now she's probably a Reiki healer or something. I have no idea. Just weird. Just a weird situation. She got the psychic uh, so, glow up sign so, in the front window. So she no, she did. <laughs> Actually, there was a red light that she hung on the Palm outside. Reading. That's funny. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, this long drawn out thing, and and the the thing about this is like in the past she had gotten behind on rent before, but she always made it good eventually, and then then like. It was getting really late, and I was like, look. She's like, I'll pay you just like I always have, and I'm kind of like, okay. And then before you know it, it got to be longer and longer, and I'm like, look, you got to pay or you can't stay type thing. And I was trying to be nice about it, but at the same time firm because mm -hmm. she's one of those types that would just look for a little bit of weakness in the conversation to try and make her problem your problem. Mm -hmm. And it's like this this is not the dynamic here. You're you're staying in a in a property I own, and the dynamic is I'm going to provide safe, clean, affordable housing for you, and you're going to pay me rent on time and look after the place. And I'll fix stuff if it breaks. That's basic, you know, that's landlord, that's landlord tenant relations one on one. And so long story longer, uh, ended up finally evicting her and the place is just, here's the, this is the funny part. So I go over there and I'm, I'm pissed at this point. Uh, I'm, I'm just done. And this is the actually there's a couple of funny things i end up going to eviction court I actually i have an attorney right but i'm self-managing this thing stupidly yeah and because it's in car it's like literally three blocks from my house it's rented i never get like i rarely get calls unless it's some drama with rent payments and so i'm just like whatever it's why pay you always had a handful that you ran yeah exactly like i still do yeah. i know <laughs> and and uh so i finally i hire this attorney and uh, he gets everything filed and handled and all that. And uh, he's like, you may want to come to eviction court, though. And I'm like, OK, but like, tell me why. And he said, well, a lot of times legal aid will set up a table right outside of the courtroom. And so when people are walking in, they're going to grab them if they're a, a tenant and they're going to say, hey, do you have representation? If they say no, they're like, well, we can help you. Was this filed? Was this filed? Was this filed? And so they try gotchas basically to see if the landlord or the property manager filed the proper notices and lease, you know, all this stuff is handled correctly. And a lot of times they're successful in getting cases thrown out of eviction court. So I'm like, all right, fine, I'll go. So I show up and we're and we're sitting in the in the like outside the courtroom, right? I'm in the there. negotiation space. Yeah, but and I'm like, oh, please don't be there. And the, there was no table and my the tenant that i'm evicting uh she's just complete drama magnet in her life right so there's always just something going on that's a d catastrophe anyway so i so my wife actually shows up to eviction court what? because she was all in on listening to all the drama about this she was just like wanted to get all the details and you know how dudes are like most of all she's ever been in real yes estate. yes <laughs> and, and so and so she she was like wanting all the details and she you know how dudes are like we just basically kind of like sum up stuff like oh here's what happened and then a lot of times wives will ask you well what did they say about this or what about this and i'm like I don't know. I didn't ask that. I'm like, my brain doesn't work that way. You yeah. know what I mean? I don't yeah, care yeah. about those things. And they, so a lot of times that that's the disconnect between husbands and wives. They want details and we just want to know the bottom line, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so she wanted to go to court and I'm like, okay. And so we show up, right. And we're sitting outside the courtroom and there's like a few people, just a real small handful, maybe like three or four people milling around are my attorneys there? Me and Jen are talking to them, and I don't see my tenant. And every time, and it's we're right by the the um, the elevator, right? So every time the elevator dings, we're I'm like, oh my god, is she gonna like walk out of here? And it's gonna be weird, and you know, is something gonna go down? I have no idea because she's like not stable. And so we're talking, and we're like, yeah, I don't know if she's gonna show up, and just kind of like talking a little bit low, but there's people kind of within earshot. So we go into the court. Finally, you know, one o'clock comes or whatever time it was. We go into the courtroom, right? And we're sitting in the row, in the back row. And the judge basically, you know, they have a docket and they read through kind of the the order of the cases. And they'll be like, you know, next up, ABC property management versus Joe Smith. And then they'll do their thing. And it's usually like five minutes, right? They'll hear, 
any type of argument the tenant has, and then you know they'll either dismiss it or grant the eviction or whatever. So they work through a few of these, and then next up, um, we're uh, we're sitting there, and my attorney gets, and they're like, yeah, next up is you know odd properties, my my LLC versus the tenant's name, and then this dude, random dude, stands up that's in the in the courtroom, and he's like, uh, Your Honor, uh, I'm the tenant's boyfriend. Uh, I'd like to speak on her behalf, and he was sitting there the whole time, like out in the out in the lobby, like listening. So, to yes, you guys yes. Oh. So yeah, no, I've never seen this guy. Yeah. I have no idea who he is. Anyway, so uh, that was just a funny sidebar. But we get up right, and uh, we're in. Fr- uh, the, my lawyer's talking to the judge, and this guy is, is like, "Yeah, my, you know, this his girlfriend, the the tenant. He he's like, yeah, she had a family emergency, so she couldn't make it. So I'm here to speak on her behalf." The judge is like, uh, "Are you on the lease, sir?" And then it's like quiet. And he's like, uh, no, I'm not. And she's like, are you an attorney? He's like, <laughs> he kind of laughs because he's just like a construction dude or whatever. And he's like, no, I'm not, obviously. you know. And then he, anyway, so she's like, well, you have no authority to speak on her behalf if you're not on lease and, and you're not an attorney. So, and, and you're not so basically beat it. you know. <laughs> yeah. Like, And so she's like, all right, well, when can you be out of the house? And it takes this long because if, if they grant you the eviction, right? They still generally have a few days because you have to then schedule the set out with the uh, the deputy is typically how they handle it in this county, right? So you win the court case, you have to contact a deputy. They basically go and post a notice, and then the notice says you have until noon on Friday, the you know fourteenth or whatever. Uh, to get all of your stuff out. And if they don't do that, then you as the property owner can then, and again, this is in this county, you can set all of their stuff just on the curb. And they're like, yeah, it's a free yeah. for all. Like it's trash at that point. Anybody can come along and take whatever they want. So they, they tell this, uh, this you know, uh, dude that, hey, you, you got until X date or, uh, you know, then it's this and that. And he turns around and looks directly at me and I don't, I can't really hear because he's like mush mouth kind of. He's just like, blah, 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 you know, talking. I can't understand anything he's saying. He looks right at me and he goes, and that's my word, not hers. Evidently, he was talking. I'm going to, we're going to be out of there in two days or three days or whatever it was. And he's like looking at me because she's just filled me full of shit for so long about I'll be out by Friday. And then Friday comes after it's too late for me to do anything about it. Oh, I need through the weekend. And then after the weekend, it was this and that, you know, just kicking the can. So anyway, got him, got both of them out and the whole, I I had a 30 yard dumps. This is 700 square foot house with no garage that they have access to. And I had a 30 yard dumpster full of crap that was left behind on top of the mountains of stuff that she took with her. I mean, it was just comical. So anyway, I was in there all, all weekend after this cleaned out, uh, this last weekend, you were talking about doing yourself, doing stuff yourself. Right. And I'm like painting and like, you did all you know, that, uh, and, and nail and trim and, you know, take doing demo and all this stuff. So you did everything not yet. I mean, it's in process, oh. but I did quite a bit of work over there. Hung light fixtures and what? yeah, yeah. I didn't know I you still, did. I still got some skills. Man. I didn't know you did any of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, there is a little bit of, you know, you need to kind of hang on to some skills just in case you need them at a later date. If nobody's available, <laughs> I cleaned off the driveway today. If that makes you feel better. Yeah, good. And, and it's all two smoke detectors. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's <laughs> tough. Today's episode is brought to you by re simply.com. If you're in the real estate game, like I am, you know, just how wild it can get managing everything from lead tracking to marketing sales and the operations. That's exactly where RE Simply, an all-in-one software for real estate investors, comes in. It's a lifesaver for thousands of investors out there. What's incredible about RE Simply is that it is packed with everything you need. List stacking, driving for dollars, automated drip campaigns, a cold call calling dialer, complete phone system, email management, speed to lead, buyer management, a comprehensive task system, accounting features, and much more. It's like a powerhouse software crafted just for us in the real estate world, eliminating the need for juggling multiple subscriptions and integrations. So check out RE Simply if you want to streamline your investing business and start closing more deals. Sign up through resimply.com backslash Hartman. That's R-E-S-I-M-P-L-I dot com backslash H-A-R-T-M-A-N. And you'll snack 50% off of your first month. Plus, they're going to throw in a 14-day trial 
So don't miss out and give it a look. I thought it, it would be a good time to revisit deal acquisitions. We're in a tough uh, time to find deals, and it seems like at any time in history, people always say that. But it's been particularly tough in the last you know, two, three years since interest rates have gone haywire, the economy's weird, real estate prices have shot up, availability's gone down, demand is huge, all that, right? Super competitive. So I thought we'd revisit this, how to find good deals in today's you know, economic environment, real estate environment. Uh, and I have some things here. I'm really curious on uh, your take. So please, you know, jump in if you got. I some will of jump in, buddy. Do it. <laughs> all right. So I think you know it all starts with relationships. And if you're a new investor, I, I get that this is probably like, oh god, please, I don't want to go through this because it's a process, not an event, to build in a relationship. So in order to be effective at this, it takes time to develop these things. You can't rush a relationship. It just doesn't work that way. But the key people that are going to be important for you to uh, get in front of deals that you can analyze and figure out which ones you want to make offers on, I have a short list here that I thought we'd kind of like touch on. One of them being uh, wholesalers. And I, th I think you obviously have a ton of experience in this, probably way, way more than I do. Uh, go, go ahead. Wholesalers, I mean, literally funded my whole entire real estate career until, until all the laws passed in recently. But I have been running across some more and more deals lately. Uh, there's just a legal way of doing it. And every, if your state has laws against it, there's a legal way to get around this. And it's disclosing. Disclose, disclose, disclose. And for those listening that are in other markets outside of Nebraska, Nebraska last year passed some legislation that outlawed basically wholesaling across the board when you're an unlicensed uh, person. Yeah. And before that, here's the best tip I can give you if you're going after wholesaler leads, which I found was my, I mean, I was making probably about $150,000 a year on commissions during this time frame. That's huge. And uh, so I, I you got to do a lot of deals to make 150 K. I, I literally got a hold of every wholesaler I could find. I created a uh, Google spreadsheet of wholesalers and Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I would call through that list and said, who do you got? What do you got? Who do you got? What do you got? Like, give me your leads. And it got to a point where I was buying so many of those leads uh, on behalf of clients that I was able to uh, get first run right of refusal. So a lot of these wholesalers started saying, hey, I'll give you 72 hours to get uh, to find a buyer for this yeah. before I put it out to the public. Okay. So it got to a point probably about 10 of that 40 uh, started giving me exclusive exclusivity on those opportunities. And... If you guys are outside of Nebraska, uh, this is a great opportunity. What I would do in that situation is if you're a real estate agent, write the offer. I used to write the offer in the, to the uh, wholesaler, and I represented my client. My client paid my commissions, and I was negotiated uh, with me and my client. We'll just leave it there. And then uh, we just went forward with it. And it, we, you, you would get the um, wholesale contract, you know, and you would go over the details. You had to abide by it. But sometimes there's some stuff in it that you might not agree with, and that's negotiable. So you you took the approach as a licensed real estate agent, a licensed broker you were at the time, right? No, but just an agent. Just an agent. Okay, yeah. so licensed real estate salesperson. You took the approach of saying, hey, wholesaler, I see you have a deal. I have a buyer that likes this deal, and guess what? I'm not asking you to pay my commission uh, I'm having the buyer pay it, which was kind of like, this is a way before the NAR lawsuit settlement. Yeah. Um, this is off market. They had somebody yeah. to pay it and the buyer, the seller wasn't going to pay and, it. And you, I think are probably the one person that I remember meeting that had that approach. I thought it was really innovative and a creative way to build a book of business as a, as an agent dealing with investors. So I, I and I wanted to explore this a little bit deeper with you on, do you think that would still work in in today's environment? Let's say, um, let's say it's not Nebraska. Yeah. Okay, let's say it's a little bit. Uh, it's another state where wholesaling is not heavily regulated like it is here. Yeah. So you go, start going to the meetups, uh, watch your Facebook groups, uh, and start meeting people. Find out what their needs are. Get their exact buy box, and find out what. And, and what I mean by that is get a little bit more detailed. Uh, there's a great podcast we did with Sarah Weaver, the very first one. And it's episode 40 something. And she really got into details about what you need from somebody. So say, hey, I, I specifically need 
to have, you know, what part time you want to be in? What's your price budget? What, you know, what, what's your must haves from your clients? How many repairs can you, can you handle? Like, uh, what do you need to be all in at? Turn what ready kind or of, not. Yeah. What kind of cash on cash return do you yep. want? Like any, the more details, the better on that. So you know, if it fits your criteria or not. Yep. Right. So we created a spreadsheet with columns and we broke every one of those down to details. Uh, then when it came, to, I got a lead in, I look at my spreadsheet at the, at, at, towards the end of that, I had over 300 buyers nationwide on that list. Okay. So that was your buyer list. That's my buyer list. I compared, uh, what I, what I had to the list and what, and then once I found, <clears throat> broke it down to everybody where it checked their boxes, I start off with the buyers that bought the most properties for me. And then I'd go from local to national from that point. You know, okay. Because it's a little bit easier with locals to you know, get things signed and communicate. And, uh, yeah, and I, it was, I was highly su- successful with it and, uh, I ended up having like other agents I worked with that would work with me on, uh, finding the, the wholesale deal. So at some point later I had, a, a another agent, uh, her name was Sarah Harvey here in town and Sarah, uh, we, she's uh, hilarious. Yeah. She's great. I mean, we worked together and for years, you know, she started calling through the wholesale list and then we started, we literally had a big whiteboard, wrote all the deals that we got down our time limit to, to find a buyer. And we go, we went to work. See, I love this because I think, um, and so in my flipping and wholetailing business, I don't, we don't wholesale properties. So we never assign contracts. We always close on them, but we've bought, like we just bought a deal last Friday from a wholesaler locally here. And, um, we, that's not typically what we do, but I, what I think is really cool about your approach is you said, I think what, three times a week. You, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, because so, they don't think they everybody they're always getting deals. Yeah, and you yeah. need to stay on top of mind. It, it, no, that is a. I, I think for those of you listening, write that down because it is a genius approach. Because yeah, it's the you know you you want you want the hot hand people that are constantly getting deals, and if you're checking in with them three times a week, you're going to be top of mind over anybody else. And I can tell you from an end buyer perspective, like I am. Um, I'm like, I either forget about it, don't think about it, don't have it on a calendar where I'm constantly following up with people so that I'm top of mind. Mm -hmm. And it's a great reminder. I mean, obviously you, you uh, built a great business out of it. So I think uh, if you take anything away from, uh, you know, Ted's description here, it's put it, put it on your calendar. Otherwise it's probably not going to happen on a regular basis enough to where it's going to move the needle for you. But on the other side of that, I mean, sometimes you just get a good lead source and you hand it off to somebody else and they'll pay you for the lead. So just kind of keep that in mind too. Yeah. Do you want to, do you want to talk about that? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So, uh, Ted had this, uh, deal. He, he was dealing with a, a motivated seller of a house in a really, really good area, um, that needed, uh, a, just some minor cosmetic, uh, work to it. So like some peeling paint on the outside furnace wasn't great. Um, other than that, it was like a lived in it's a pretty immaculate house. Yeah. And so, you know, Ted happened, we go to lunch one day and Ted happens to, you know, I don't remember how exactly you mentioned it, but you're like, Hey, I, I had just, a deal and it fell through. Yeah. I had yeah. a deal and it fell through. And he's like, do you want to, you know, maybe contact the, the owner and, and, uh, it, long story short, we ended up buying the deal and then, um, to make it worth Ted's while, you know, we gave him a, gave him a uh, little bonus, a finder's fee, or I don't know what the legal term to call it is now. <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble, but uh, we compensated you for your efforts. There was nothing which legal is there because it, it was just a lead that I handed off. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, you know, when, 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 I, I think the seller ended up pretty happy because, you know, we made a pretty painless uh, real estate transaction out of it. You got a little money in your pocket for passing on a lead. You didn't really have to do any of the dirty work. Well, I mean, you found it and and all that. Obviously, that's not and I easy. Didn't, you know, and the, the fact that you just said, "Hey, man, I I paid for this lead, so thank you for doing it." I'm like, I wasn't expecting it. Well, of and, course. And, was, and but I mean, that that was awesome. Yeah. And so you know, if you're in town and you got a lead, hit Owen up and and bring it to him because yes. there might be an opportunity there for Boom. you. Boom. Now, I do want to I do want to underline part of what you just said though because. I have heard, um, I've talked to several people recently who have dealt with others that are total tight asses about, um, you know, they only want to get, they're, they're really like beating down wholesalers on deals, like trying to get them to take less and less and less of a fee, even though they're, they weren't getting much anyway. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it, and this is like several people that I've talked to, right? So um, I just think, 
take care of people and they're going to take care of you. I don't, I don't understand the whole like tripping over pennies when you're trying to pick up dollars. I just don't get it. I mean, if you're listening to this and you think about, you know, somebody that's paid you for whatever um, random thing that you did for them, maybe you just helped them out and it wasn't expected. When that opportunity comes up, they're always going to be first in mind. So, you know, if I have another lead like this, Owen's going to literally be the first person I call. And I'm like, hey, dude, this is an opportunity. I think you should take a look at it. Yeah. So uh, point being, take care of those that take care of you and give without, um, you know, expecting anything in return is another thing. I mean, this wasn't a quid pro quo thing. I genuinely appreciate it. You didn't yeah. have to do what you did. So, yeah. um, so that's uh, one, you know, tactic for finding some deals. I think it's a great one. And I think one I need to re-implement because I've kind of gotten off the, off the wagon with uh, being consistent on some of this follow-up stuff. It's easy to do when you start chasing other things and other deals. And, well, it, it comes with just being busy, I think. I think yeah. we all kind of just, you know, get in our grind and, the, and then we forget about what really makes us money in the end. Yeah. And that, you know, what's funny is uh, that, so I I, I want to bring this up and we, we love him and he's probably going to be like embarrassed I'm bringing this up, but Nate Eccles uh, had a post recently on Facebook. Did you see this? Maybe I don't know. So he he quit his job, a uh, long time job, and he was making well into six figures, uh, working for a, a pretty notable corporation in I was Omaha. Shocked when I heard out much that he was actually yeah. There. Was and so cool. he he was a you know pretty high paid uh, you know salaried guy and had done that for a number of years. Um, you know had has an awesome daughter who is uh, kicking butt we've already. Had the, we've had them all on the podcast. Yep. And they were, uh, we'll have to link to that in the show notes, what episode they were, but uh, just they're awesome father daughter team. And Nate, you know, posted a really vulnerable post uh, on Facebook. And he was basically talking about how, you know, he left his job, took a leap of faith and uh, was hoping to pursue multifamily uh, as a, as you know, his next deal. And what happened was it sounds like he kind of got away. He didn't stick to his knitting on the stuff that gave him enough confidence to leave his job. So he was a flipper and had some Burr properties, single families, um, and then eventually wanted to chase multifamily because it's the hot ticket, right? And it turns out he only bought, I think, one deal uh, in the past year. And he said, you know, the, the downside of this is I didn't, be I'm not as successful in the business as I thought I would be, but now I realize I need to get back to basics and make the you know do the things that were making me a lot of money and making me successful, and then I could be more strategic about my moves instead of going all in. It's tough to go all in on something that's fairly new to you, uh, unless you know you have somebody that's a partner or that can guide you along, right? Yeah, I I mean I feel like that right now. I. I got into this whole like team leader being a broker uh, business for a couple of years and to get back into being a, an investment real estate agent uh, has been a massive struggle the last couple of months. I, like, oh, has it really? Yeah. Like it, it, I thought it would be like, just like, Oh, I'm not doing this. I'm going to transition my life, but I'm, I've re my life is different than it was then. And I, and I'm much more lazier now. <laughs> <laughs> but i need to oh you didn't you weren't the hunter for a long time yeah right? i've been i've been out of it yeah i've been uh you know people i have people doing my real estate leads for me now i mean i you know i i just gotta get back into it I, i'm not making the same money i used to and i know there's a lot of opportunity and i can do it but it's you know it's hard knocking the dust off yeah it is. <laughs> i mean i just got a couple of deals done this week thank goodness but uh but it's not it's not the same yeah yeah i totally agree um so to kind of finish the 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 thought on this topic, then we, we were talking about how to acquire deals in, in today's market. Um, you know, there's some other things that I, that I think are notable in here that I wanted to call out. So building relationships, we touched on that. Uh, the fact that you built a whole business on working with wholesalers, that's awesome and commendable. Um, I think there's some overlooked ones in here that I wanted to touch on, just people that could possibly provide you with some good leads. And you can't just skip to the end here and be like, hey, I know you're an attorney. You want to send me some probate leads, right? You got to build that relationship. So it's like build the well before you get thirsty. You know, the Jordan Harbinger. Uh, you love that line. I do. <laughs> um, but uh, here, here's some. So th this is a short list of, of uh, people that are potentially good lead sources for you and their professions. So the professionals, attorneys, CPAs, insurance agents. These people deal every single day with 
generally higher net worth individuals, and a lot of them are going to have real estate holdings, or a lot of them are going to have family members of their client that have passed away, and maybe they need uh, to dispo, you know, dispose of a house. Uh, maybe they're a probate attorney, whatever. So the point is, don't overlook professionals. Ask for referrals. Let them know what you're looking for. And this is uh, this kind of will dovetail into what I'm talking about here. Get very specific on your criteria. Build your buy box to a point where you know it cold. Anybody that's asking you, be very specific about what you're looking for. Three bed, two bath, two car garage, this neighborhood, this zip code, whatever it is. And if you have a pretty wide category, don't just say, I'm just looking for a deal. Nobody's going to send you anything. Get very specific about it, and you'll be surprised when people remember you because they're going to be like, oh, yeah, you're the guy that buys in District 66, or you're going to buy, you know, you're the guy that likes you know, stuff in this part of town or whatever. Right. And don't forget your banker leads too, because Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. Because I just had somebody reach out to me recently and they specifically were looking for bank owned properties that they wanted, that they were holding and want to take off. You do need to be a cash buyer and you need, you need to know somebody that's probably the vice president or higher in a bank to get those leads. Yep. Great tip. But look into that. Uh, okay. So some other ones, the, sh the short list here is obviously real estate agents. And this one, I think get your, your, uh, your deal, box identified, your buy box identified, and then start reaching out to all of these agents. There's going to be, you know, what are there? 2000 some agents in Omaha. Omaha has got in roughly 3000 something. 3000 fa fastly going down. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a great time to break into that industry. I don't know but, if fastly is a word, maybe quickly going down. Yeah. But you, uh, so 3000 in a, in an MSA that has, you know, like right around a million people. Um, but that's 3000 agents and you're going to be able to probably tell fairly quickly which ones are producers and which aren't but reach out to them just make it a, you know how do you need how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time right so just tackle that list start having lunch coffee beer whatever reaching out to those people build a relationship tell them what you're looking for and stay top of mind so follow up is key um property managers oh man this is such a great lead source and a lot of times property managers have their own real estate license too. yes so they, yeah they have to so, yes and but a lot of times yeah, sometimes there's a broker owner that's uh, that isn't involved, and then there's eight, there's people underneath that don't true. have yeah, license. True. But if they do, you can give referrals on when you close that property, and if you give them a referral, they love you, and they will keep on sending you leads. Not only that, so we had a guest on our uh, podcast uh, named Stephen Ward, and he owns Exceptional Properties Group, uh, property management business, and he has basically built a pretty slick uh, little niche within that, and he. His whole goal is he wants to capture the property management business, but he also makes commissions every time you as a property owner sell. And what he likes to do is he'll identify a property for you to trade up into and that he can continue managing for you. And then hopefully he still captures that that legacy property that you already sold. Whoever the new buyer is, he's going to introduce himself as I manage this asset. I helped uh, do the turnaround. I stabilized it and I helped the owner sell it. And you know, I'd love to manage for you. So he wants to capture both ends, help you continue growing as a real estate investor and still manage your properties. I think it's a genius approach to it. And he's one of very few that I've met that, that do it that way. But they're good sources because a lot of times, you know, he's going to know probably before anybody when I'm ready to sell one of the assets that he's managing. I'm going to tell him. I'm going to be like, hey, I'm probably going to unload this and I want a 1031 into something else. Be on the lookout for something for me. I like to be on that list too. Yeah, uh, we'll see. <laughs> uh, so let, let's see. A uh, couple other uh, items on here. So again, this is, you know, deals and how to find them. The MLS. And I want to touch on this. But you and I were just talking before we started recording. Everybody, no matter what, always says there's no deals out there. There's nothing on the MLS. I don't even look anymore because there's not ever so picked over. Everybody's going to see it, right? There's deals on the MLS. Yeah. And not only that, you make deals off the MLS. You don't find them generally. It's I just, I had, while I'm sitting here, I had a call because I, we had an offer. We put in three weeks on a property. They were asking two sixty five, and my my client's like, man, I really can't see that going more than two fifteen. And he's had some major rough work, so on, so on. And it, it came back, and then every week the number went lower and lower. And then uh, this morning they came back like, hey, we'll take that two fifteen offer. Yes. <laughs> and so I have a note here. Um, my whole goal with working off the MLS to when I identify some leads that fit my criteria, my whole goal is to get a counter offer. 
so that I know what they're what, closer to what their actual real number is. So don't be afraid to make offers. And you don't have to make like a no contingency offer. You can just make something like, you know, subject to a 24 hour walkthrough by my partner. And if you're, if, just so you know, if your agent is competent and has some reputation, uh, you don't have to put in a written offer every time. Your a, a agent that's competent can call that uh, other agent and be like, hey, my, this is my client's offer. I don't want to waste your time, my time, or my client's time. And here's my verbal. And here's the stipulations. You can give them your, you know, the five or six things with inspections and everything else that goes along with it. And if they don't take it, great. And if they not, they'll, they'll let you know if they will take it at great some point. Great tip. It's a big time saver for you as an agent, too, because then you don't have to work through like the, you know, the the purchase agreement and deal with all the back and forth and the phone calls. So, Cause yeah, great just tip. Just so you guys know, if, you, if you're using the agent and you keep on telling them to write offers, and it takes, it can take an, if they're a new agent, it'll take them three, four hours to write that offer. If they're an experienced agent, they can probably get through it in about 45 minutes, but it's still time. Yep. Good tip. So, uh, on the MLS, uh, here's another uh, quick tip for you. Whatever agent you decide to end up working with, and I, I also like the approach of finding a property that you really like on the MLS that fits, uh, you know, checks all of your boxes, mm. call that agent and give them the opportunity to show you the house. And then when they do show you that house, be like, hey, do you list more of these? Like, this is exactly what I want. Do you have any more? Call tip. me whenever, whenever you have something. And guess what? That agent should be able to get more commission out of the deal, theoretically, if they're representing you and uh, it's their listing, right? Also, if you're working with a, an agent and you're trying to show them exactly what you're looking for, maybe it's not the right price. But by send them the property that hits all of uh, your yeah. buy box details. Like this is exactly what I'm looking for. But this is the price I need to get on something like yeah. this. Yeah, that's great. Great tip. So uh, last thing on the MLS. So I have uh, a note here. These are some keywords that I like to incorporate. And you can have whoever your agent is that you're working with. It can build uh, basically a filter that they apply to the MLS. And anytime, and they'll set up a search savers for you. So if it's Owen J or Joe, new home buyer. They can set it up to where it's going to email you anytime something hits that list that meets your criteria and the keywords that you want to apply to it. You're going to get an email and you could say, okay, hey, new listing today. Here it is. So I use the keyword investor. Yep. And any, because anytime somebody said uh, this is a, it's got potential or anything, if, if they want and attract an investor, they always put that word somewhere. Yep. And, and they might say investor, investing, invest, uh, invest, you know, like, some iteration of invest. So you can include more of those and you'll get more, more search results. But yeah, great tip as is fixer, handyman, hammer. Cause a lot of people say like, you know, swing a hammer and you can build your own equity, blah, blah, blah. Uh, motivated seller needs work repairs, estate sale, TLC, good bones, bank owned foreclosure. Those are all keywords that are going to generate the type of properties. If you're going to fix and flip a house, or if even if you're going to wholetail it or whatever, that's probably going to hit your uh, radar uh, if you include those. So some other things here, uh, so moving on from the MLS, Facebook marketplace and groups, there's some great investor specific groups that are out there in, in Facebook. Just search for the, the location that you're uh, looking to invest in. And, and, you know, put in the keyword investor and you're going to find that or put in real estate and you'll find a combination of those. So just play around with the words. Every city in most small towns yeah. have a RIA group. So join it, check it out. Some are more active than others, but if no matter where you are, there's probably a RIA group. They might not be affiliated with national RIA, but just join that local RIA. Yep. That's a, that's a great tip too. So, uh, another, uh, another thought here, there's a lot of tools out there that make it easy to analyze deals. And sometimes they can generate leads for you based on looking up a property that you really like. And the only reason that it hasn't sold is nobody can figure out who the actual owner is because it's layered in LLCs, but there's deals like Reonomy, for example. So if you go to reonomy.com, and I think it's R E O N O M Y. This is not a cheap software, but if you sign up for it, it, it will allow you to get email addresses, mailing addresses, phone numbers for anybody that's associated with particular LLCs. Do you this have is, this? Uh, I know, but I may or may not have used someone else's login a few times uh, to, uh, to access it. It is really powerful and not all that hard to use. Really. It's just expensive. It's like, I, and I haven't even looked at the pricing. It's like five or 600 a month. Wow. Oh, not cheap. But if you get one deal out of it, pays for multiple years of it. Uh, so deal machine is another one. Yardy. If you're looking for a uh, really good data, Crexy, LoopNet. Um, there's a lot of them out there. I'm probably missing several. 
uh, but those are those are good tools to use when you're sourcing info. Um, and we've talked about this in other episodes, but direct mail uh, remains a tried and true uh, method of uh, attracting leads that end, end up in deals. And you can sort the the lists that you get. I, I used list source before, but mm-hmm. I think a great tip if you're in a, a city of any size is call your county assessor and ask them. Typically, they're going to have a GIS department, which is Geographical Information Services. And they basically will have a database of every property in the entire county and all kinds of data about it. So who the owner is, how long it's been owned, what the assessed value is, last sale date, any of that stuff. And if you call your assessor, a lot of times you can either get a free list, which is obviously the best, or maybe it's a small you know, portion where you're paying that, that person for their time. So like 50, 100 bucks. And you can do that in Omaha, Douglas County. Mm-hmm. Done it multiple times. Um, another one, PP, uh, pay-per-click and SEO. We've talked about this in other episodes too. So that's basically getting a website, driving traffic to it, and then getting inbound leads that come from a direct effort of your marketing online. Um, lastly, cold calling, texting. These are kind of more advanced strategies, typically layered on by more experienced investors that have been doing this a while and they, uh, or wholesalers. And they kind of have a good backbone to their business built up. So I think uh, hopefully you get some good, uh, you know, meat and potatoes out of this for a way to, um, you know, scare up some deals in this tough environment that we've been operating in. Yeah, lots of good tips there. I like that we're, we we don't normally talk about this type of stuff. I know. I, it's fun to get down in the weeds and back to basics, though. I mean, yeah. like we've, uh, you know, talked with some high level folks and authors and things like that, where we've talked more about mindset recently, which is really cool. I like I a lot of times like to just roll up my sleeves and say, hey, you know, I'll evict people. I'll uh, I'll swing a hammer every now and then or get a paintbrush in my hand. And just like you, you know, you're moving in stuff into an Airbnb. So I think getting back to basics and doing the things that are going to generate leads, which end up in deals is a tried and true way to you know build your business and maintain it and we had literally have a whole nother sheet of stuff to go through so if you like what you're hearing today please like get on the reviews leave us a five star first but then get in the notes and tell us that you do like this type of format or what's the type of format that you do like so we know how to grow this podcast and and kind of tailor it more to our listeners yeah and these are fun i mean you know ted and i always like hanging out and shooting the the real estate shit but um we drink it old-fashioned yeah and and if you uh if you like what you're hearing with this um let us know and we can certainly incorporate this into into uh you know further episodes so uh it was fun yeah, it's always good chatting with you, and uh, it's kind of weird talking as much. It, <laughs> but, but, You're welcome. But, you know, people listen to this are like, I bet this, when's the next like, per- who's that guy? <laughs> Who are they interviewing today when they come on? <laughs> this is not just the intro, just so you know. Yeah. <laughs> and with that, Owen, do you want to see us out today? On behalf of Rio Radio, Dennis Bertrand, and Ted Kosh, I'm Owen Dashner, and you've been listening to The OT with Owen, Owen and Ted. Ted. Again. Radio Edit. On behalf of Rio Radio, Dennis Bertrand, and Ted Kosh, I'm Owen Dashner, and you've been listening to. What have, we, what have they been listening to? <laughs> you've been listening to us ramble about real estate Through for the, the last shit. hour. Yeah. <laughs>